let's launch <laughs> and hear first of all from David. Thank you very much, Sharon. Right, so um, I'm going to talk about the evidence, almost all of which comes from the government itself. Um, new data was released yesterday, bringing us up to September uh, last year. So even if you've heard me talk about this before, hopefully it will be interesting. And for the first time, the results of mandatory reconsiderations have been published. So people have been wondering what uh, that new system is going to do. So uh, here, here's going to be the facts. So all, all of what I'm showing here uses the new data, runs to exceptions, which I've highlighted. And also there was an important uh, Freedom of Information release, which I got last week, about repeat sanctions, which I've incorporated in the presentation. So here are the important facts about the way that the sanctions regime has been tightened under the coalition. So. Um, JSA, 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 there are two lots of sanctions I'm talking about, JSA and ESA. I'm not actually talking about the loan parent income support sanctions in this, although one could. Uh, they, are, they have become less important because so many loan parents have been transferred onto JSA, actually. They now form, there's now about 120,000 loan parents who are on JSA, um, who've been taken off income support because their oldest child is um, older than five. So it's difficult to monitor everything all the time, so I'm not actually covering the remaining ones who are on income support. So the main thing is JSA, and then I'm also covering ESA. So the JSA sanctions, they're sanctioning 6.5% of their claimants a month. They often quite deliberately get that understood as being 6.5% a year, and they're very careful not to disabuse anyone of that notion, because um, they then get people saying, oh, it's only a tiny minority of people are sanctioned. I had to write to a Tory MP a couple of weeks ago for saying something, um, saying exactly that quite, quite blatantly. Um, she'd obviously misunderstood, she'd been dis you know, just bamboozled by her local job centre. The rate for young people is um, twice the level for other claimants. And uh, this chap, Chris Hayes, who's head of strategy or something like that at DWP, he really did say this at the uh, House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee a couple of weeks ago. So the rate of sanction has gone up two and a quarter times uh, compared to what it was before the coalition came in. It was under 3% before, which is bad enough, 3% per month. Um, so, of course, this if you're sanctioning 6.5% every month, and of course it, it builds up, and so over one-fifth of all JSA claimants in the five years to March 2014 were sanctioned, and almost as high a proportion in the single financial year 2013-14 alone. The reason why there's so little difference in the figures is that Lots and lots of people keep coming back onto the unemployed register. The typical, most people, over 70% of the population, never are never claimant unemployed. Um, so that all the unemployment is suffered by the remaining 30% or so. And their typical pattern is that they cycle between unemployment and low paid jobs, and then unemployment again, and then another low paid job, and so on. So it's the same people coming back all the time. Of all the individuals who are sanctioned in the, the latest 12 months, almost a third were sanctioned more than once. So, you, you know, you hear ministers and um, people like Paul Gregg in Bristol saying, oh, sanctions are effective because most people are only sanctioned once. <laughs> well, there's a very large minority who keep on getting sanctioned. Um, and over the, over the um, whole period of the whole existence of this sanction regime or the existence of, of data, in the current form since 2000, two-fifths of sanctioned claimants received more, um, two or more sanctions. So multiple sanctions. Sanctions are, are very common. You, you've got a one in five chance of being sanctioned if you claim JSA. And repeat sanctions are very common. You've got a 40% chance of being of sanctioned more than once if, if you're sanctioned at all. Um, the numbers of JSA sanctions are falling now because the claimant count is falling. But the percentage rate has stabilised at this high level of 6.5%. Um, 
ESA sanctions are a much lower rate, but they have been escalating in the last uh, year or 18 months, and they've now risen to 0.81 of a percent per month. There have been an awful lot of revisions to the ESA um, sanctions figures, actually, which I haven't seen DWP <coughs> comment on. I don't, they did have some very high figures at one point, which they seem, seem to have withdrawn. I don't think it's just because of appeals, but I've not been able to go into it fully. Really. <coughs> so apart from the numbers, the other thing is that JSA sanctions have been lengthened, and they've particularly focused on the most commonly occurring ones. Um, from October 2012. And also the ESA sanctions, which are imposed on people in the work-related activity group, they were made much harsher from December 2012. So the main change was that instead of losing the £25 a week work-related activity allowance, they instead lose the personal allowance, which is the £71 a week, although they keep the £25 work-related activity allowance. The minimum period for a sanction is now four weeks. There are very harsh penalties for repeat failures. It escalates very rapidly. The second sanction attracts three months um, loss of benefit. And then they've introduced these notorious three-year sanctions. We don't know how many people uh, those have affected. DWP in this FOI response told me they didn't, they didn't know. It cost them more than 600 pounds to find out. I've written back to them and said, look, you can't be serious about this. You must know how many and so on. So they've said they've referred it to their review team. But uh, anyway, at the moment, we don't know how many people have had three-year sanctions. And to put this in perspective, the maximum penalty for 75 years up to 1986 was six weeks loss of benefits. Which, and it wasn't, basically it wasn't about sanctions. This was if you gave up your job voluntarily, you made yourself voluntarily unemployed you couldn't claim for the first six weeks. That was basically the system. Um, so here's the updated chart showing you the JSA and ESA sanctions before any uh, appeal processes. And uh, you can see the... Um, oh, that's not supposed to be there, by the way. <laughs> that huge escalation, partly due to the um, recession, of course, increasing the number of claimants, that dip there is due to the introduction of the work program when responsibility for sanctions was transferred to contractors or initiating them. Uh, so there was a hiccup then. And then they reached this peak last year and they started to fall back now because of the uh, falling number of claimants. So this is the total number of sanctions. The blue line is the JSA and the red line is JSA plus ESA. So you can see ESA is a very small factor actually, in terms of the numbers of sanctions. Um, in terms of distress, more arguable, but in terms of num sheer numbers, it's a small factor. Uh, this go the chart goes back to 1997, and it shows you sanctions per month after any appeals as a percentage of claimants. So you can see it chugged along JSA at 2%. John Hutton came in with a remit from Tony Blair to drive it up and duly drove it up. It fell back at the beginning of the recession because they had better things to do like registering newly unemployed people. And then it's uh, shot up again. This is the same dip due to the starting of the work program. And you can see the level stabilized at this about 5.5% after appeals. ESA sanctions came in in 2008. You can see they started at a very high level and fell off. These were all about in, not coming to interviews. And then this growth subsequently is about um, not turning up for your for work program interviews and activities and so on. So, um, I haven't updated this chart. This is a summary of the reasons for sanctions for um, these years, 1997, 2003, 2009, uh, 2013, first half of last year. What's happened under the coalition is that this actively seeking, actively not actively seeking work ones, absolutely shot up from almost nothing. And then the other one that's really shot up is the work program sanctions. And then not attending an interview has in fact fallen back a bit from the level that it was under the Labour government. And then all the other reasons are much less important. 
Um, reasons for the ESA sanctions. You, the blue line is failure to attend a mandatory interview. And you can see that they built up very, very fast under the Labour government, up to th over 3.5% a month. Then they fell back. They've then been at a very low level, half a percent per month since then. But then the... Um, 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 there's something wrong with the scale that I've noticed, actually. <laughs> Suppose it, it, I'm not quite sure what's happened with the scale. But anyway, in terms of proportions, this is correct. The number of um, proportion of... Um, oh, sorry, it's thousands. It's thousands. That's 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 what I'm getting mixed up. So, um, yeah, the numbers went up to 3,500 of the failure to attend interview. They're now chugging along at under 500. And then up to uh, the middle, up to the start of the work program, there weren't any of these failure to participate in work-related activity. And since then, they've been escalating, and particularly last year, they seem to now stabilise at around 3,000 a month. So that's the story. So it's now the big thing now is not attending your work-related activity, which obviously people tell you they have difficulty with because they have off days and stuff like that. One good summary of, of the total impact is the amount of money lost to claimants, because obviously it's the number of weeks of sanction times the amount of money people lose. So I've just actually wor worked out some updated estimates. So my original estimate for JSA 2005 was 37 million. Um, the year to October 2012, which was the last year of the old regime, it had gone up to 140 million. That was due entirely to the increase in the number of sanctions because the, um, plus I suppose the change in the weekly rate of, of benefit. But it wasn't due to any, the lengthening sanctions. But the amount in 2013-14 gone up to something like 330 million. Um, and that's the effect both of more sanctions and longer sanctions. ESA is a very small item. 4.3 million. In that estimate, I've assumed that the time, ESA sanctions all have this time to compliance thing followed by a sanction. I've assumed the average time to compliance is one week. But I found if I doubled it to two weeks, the amount of money was still only 6 million. So it's definitely quite a small amount. However, the other big effect of sanctions, as uh, I think it was Sharon mentioned, is people get, somebody mentioned, people get driven off claiming benefit at all. Um, so suppose 100,000 people have been driven off the count by sanctions, then the government's saving another 350 million from that. The 350 million plus 328 plus your 5 million for ESA, that's getting you up to best part of a billion pounds. Uh, yes, there is that paper published by the Oxford University people last month. Um, but they didn't actually turn it into a number off the count. I think the, I th I think the number off the account is, you know, through, from the recent changes, is certainly something like 60,000. And it might well be, it probably is 100,000 or something overall. Um, the, um, there are some figures, actually, that they published from the um, JSA quarterly inquiry which they, they mostly don't publish the findings from that, but, but you can get some stuff on freedom of information. It probably is something like 100,000, I think. And one bit of evidence is that the percentage of unemployed young people, that's not counting students, who don't claim JSA, has risen to about 60%. And that, per that percentage has doubled since the introduction of the longer sanctions penalties in October 2012. So that's quite an important um, indicator. There's obviously also loads of, of non-statistical evidence from places like this about, about the sanctions regime. I'm not going to go into that. Um, however, I'm, I'm going to talk about the appeal system because you want to know about the impact of mandatory reconsideration. The appeal system is a joke, basically. Um, the government's own survey, the Peters and Joyce survey, um, published in 2006, 
it found, you know, that most claimants had a totally pessimistic attitude towards appeal. Um, they didn't have the time, they didn't have the money, and they didn't think it would get them anywhere. So hardly anybody appeals. Only about 20% of sanctioned JSA claimants were making any challenge. The coalition's aggressive tactics drove that up to about 30%. And it's in response to that that the coalition has brought in mandatory reconsideration, which is a very onerous system from the, for the client. You can't just fill in a form and appeal. You now uh, have to tell them, there's no form, you have to tell them that you object. And then they will phone you at home when you haven't got your advisor there, and maybe you haven't got your papers even available, and they will explain to you why you've been sanctioned and why your prospects of appeal are hopeless. Or at least that's, you know, what one can imagine they do. And um, it's only if you persist after that that they, they will fill in a form to request a mandatory reconsideration. And that form will then go to the disputes resolution team which is a, a centralised operation, and then there will be a mandatory reconsideration. It's only if you, if you uh, then continue disputing the decision after that stage that you're allowed to go to a tribunal. So there's no independent element until you get there. So the result is mandation has pretty well killed off tribunal cases. And what it certainly hasn't dealt with is the abusive system of, of punishing people without a, <coughs> without a hearing. <coughs> it's further reduced the, <coughs> the rate of appeal. i to get some water, sorry. And <coughs> it's reduced the independent element um, in the system. There's, I mean, the tribunal is the only independent element. There is no other independent element in this system. It's all under the control of the Secretary of State. So, to summarise the impact of mandatory consideration, this shows you the three types of appeal. The, the decision review, this is, this is when they ring you up after you've challenged uh, the sanction. The mandatory reconsideration is, is this formal process with the centralised disputes resolution team and the appeals is the tribunal, right? And so then we've got the coalition here. You can see that the number of people asking for decision reviews shot up under the coalition, not surprisingly because far more people were being sanctioned. The number of appeals to tribunal also rose. When they introduced mandatory reconsideration, the number of these decision reviews has come skating back down. The number of mandatory <coughs> reconsiderations has gone up and the number of tribunal appeals has fallen to practically nothing. Um, and then if you, this, this chart summarises the overall impact. So first of all, we've got challenges as a percentage of all initially adverse decisions. All the people who got a sanction this shows you the percentage you challenged it in any way. And so it was going up to 30%. And then it's come back down, since mandatory reconsideration, come down to just over 20%. Then the second question is, what percentage of challenges were successful? So I'm taking of all challenges, that's all the three stages, review, mandatory reconsideration, or tribunal. And you can see that Actually, the per before mandatory consideration, the percentage that was successful was falling quite fast, but under mandatory consideration, it's risen. Now, let's see, this seems to be because when they ring up, uh, ring people up, people disclose more the facts and so on, as a result of which they sometimes reverse the decision. So then, the third question is, what's happened to the percentage of original sanction decisions which are upheld? throughout any appeals and you can see that 90% roughly are upheld and that under mandatory reconsideration the percentage that are upheld has actually fallen slightly so mandatory reconsideration actually slightly improved um, sanctioned people's success rate 
but only very, very marginally. Then we've got ESA, so it's the same, go through the same process. We can see that there were very few um, requests for decision review. After the coalition increased the penalties, they started shooting up under mandatory reconsideration because the numbers were escalated, because the numbers of sanctions were escalating so fast, it didn't immediately halt that increase in decision reviews, but you can see that they have come back down now, in spite of the numbers of, um, of sanctions still going up. <coughs> um, mandatory reconsiderations have, have increased to a very small extent to take their place, and then tribunal appeals, which were very few in the first place, they're, they're virtually non-existent. And then the impact of mandatory reconsideration, well, um, it's actually been rather damaging to ESA claims, which is the which is the blue line. You can see that the um, percentage of originally adverse decisions which were upheld throughout the appeal process had been falling. Mandatory reconsideration has put it up again. And that's a combination of the effects of fewer people challenging the decision um, combined with a fall in the percentage of challenges which are successful under mandatory reconsideration. So man you could sum up by saying mandatory reconsideration overall has been slightly favourable to JSA claimants but distinctly unfavourable to ESA claimants. But of course it hasn't, it hasn't dealt with the problem that the vast majority of people do not ask for any sort of appeal anyway. Um, it's interesting that the government is still trying to claim that they're not putting sanctions up. Uh, Esther McVeigh at the House of Commons Work and Pension Committee just a couple of weeks ago, she, she was um, you know, quoting some phony statistics. I tried to put it on the slide, but she was so incoherent, actually, that no matter how I edited her remarks, I could not turn them into something intelligible enough to put, in, put onto a slide. But I tell you that they are still claiming that they're not putting up sanctions, and that's only one of many many misrepresentations. So they, they say they believe in sanctions, but they don't believe in them enough to admit <laughs> that they're actually promoting law. So what's really going on? Well, Sharon, I think, will talk about this just very briefly. I mean, it's this neoliberal ideology. Part of that is this supply-side theory of unemployment. Sanctions are vital because these uh, very deficient people, um, such as we had to put in workhouses in the 19th century, you know, um, they don't know what's good for them. You can't treat them as fellow citizens, basically. They're only fit to be bullied. And of course, we don't have social insurance anymore, by the way. Um, you don't get social security benefits because you've paid into the scheme while you're working, because um, nobody who works claims social security uh, benefits. And, well, at least that seems to be the story. <laughs> Because the people who pay taxes are this lot over here who never claim on the Social Security, and the people who claim on Social Security are people who never work. And this is the model that has been <coughs> sold to us, and the policies are based on this kind of ideology, and then the evidence is tailored to fit that. Unfortunately, the Labour governments, 1997 to 2010, they operated the sanction system more reasonably, but they didn't reform it, and they made it, made it worse in a number of ways, extending it to lone parents, the long-term sick, increased the penalty of missed interviews, and abolished independent adjudication. It's quite a, quite a charge sheet. Um, they also perpetuated most of the myths about active labour market policy, and so on. The really dreadful, I recommend that really dreadful paper in 2008 on the role of conditionality. You should definitely read that. And then under the coalition, we've had this further intensification. A lot of it, I think, is just to save money. And then, of course, it's also to look tough, strike these postures. So there we are. I've added some um, stuff about where you can get more information. <laughs>